I really wanted to say a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about my book. You know, all uh, writers write because through the process of writing, they're coming up with their own answers. And what set me off in uh, writing Pioneers of the Possible was two years ago when I read this research that said that personal example is the most effective medium for social transformation. And that means that other people's lives can serve as a source of inspiration for all of us to go deeper and reach higher and do things that we never envisioned that we could do. So when I had that uh, thought in my mind, I thought, how great would it be to do research and find these extraordinary women from all parts of the world who have done remarkable things in different fields and share those stories with, with the reader. And in the meantime, while I'm reading, I can really find out what all these women had in common. What were the common threads that really contributed to their fulfillment and their success? And I have a few stories to share and a, a, a few vignettes of the women that I have showcased in the book, just uh, for you to get a little flavor of uh, what you're about to read. So, one of the most remarkable stories, and I think that one is a favorite of uh, a couple of my friends and David, is Master Chen Yen. Master Chen Yen is a Buddhist nun who ordained herself at the age of 18 to be a nun. You know, usually you have a master that comes to shave your head. She did not wait for a master, she shaved her own head and went along. But what is so extraordinary about her is that she has founded her own sect of Buddhism, which is called Buddhism in Action, which now enjoys the, uh, I can say she has 10 million followers under her sect of Buddhism. And what she has done is she has made, she has inspired millions of people not only to give willingly to her cause, which is in annual donations of $350 million and an endowment nearing a billion dollars. But what she has done with those donations is that she has created the largest blood bank, bone marrow bank in Asia. She is considered to be the Mother Teresa of Far East. She was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. And she has one of the largest uh, emergency care nonprofits in the world. And this is from a woman who was born in this remote corner of Taiwan with a sixth grade education, who has never flown outside of Taiwan, but gives money all over the world. As a matter of fact, when uh, Hurricane Katrina hit, she was the first to give money, $14 million, within the first week. And she dispatched thousands of people to come and help. So you hear a story like that and you wonder, how is her philosophy compared to that of Simone de Beauvoir or Frida Kahlo. I uh, had the great privilege of uh, meeting Jacqueline Novakratz. Jacqueline Novakratz um, graced the cover of Fortune magazine this December, and uh, yesterday I was uh, meeting with, uh, she has founded the Acumen Fund, and yesterday I was meeting with one of the people who runs Acumen Fund, and I said, how lucky was I that I got to interview her before she went on the cover because I wouldn't have written that chapter anymore. <laughs> but what is extraordinary about her is that, you know, her life also flies in the face of common myth that from the very start we need to know what we're going to be doing with the rest of our lives. She was a successful person on, um, uh, in Wall Street and she walked away from that job and started working at the time in the 80s in a microfinance uh, division for women in Africa. Now she has uh, affected and changed the lives of over 38 million, dollar, uh, 38 million people with her Acumen Fund. And what she has done is changed the face of philanthropy. With the money that she gets and puts into the Acumen Fund, which is a um, almost like a hybrid between um, a venture capital fund and a philanthropy fund. She invests in businesses that bring uh, clean water, healthcare, housing to the neediest all over the world. 
And so, you know, when I talk about this, I also want to talk about some of the iconic women who are showcased in the book. One is Ella Fitzgerald. Of course, we all know her as the, you know, the mother of jazz. And she has earned all the honors that you can ever imagine, honorary doctorates from Yale and other universities, and 13 Grammys. But do you know that uh, she thought that she was going to be a dancer? As a matter of fact, when she went to audition at the Apollo Theater Amateur Night, she looked at the group that was uh, auditioning, and there was a dance group that was far better than her, and right away she switched. She switched and said, okay, tomorrow night I'm actually going to audition for singing. And the rest is history. Actually, she won. And at the time, she was homeless. So when she won and people wanted to go and give her a contract and the prize money, they couldn't find her. And they said, well, you know, she usually hangs out at this corner. Maybe you should go and find her there. She usually is there dancing. So, you know, these are incredible stories. But what all of these women have in common is that they were very much, they were so true to themselves in the sense that from early on, they knew what their strengths were, they knew where their talents were, and they built a life around those strengths and talents. And that is something that we all can learn from. It's not really true for women only, but for everyone. Research really shows that in our whole uh, pop psychology culture, we're always looking at our weaknesses, and we're trying to see how we can perfect ourselves. But really, what struck me the most is that we have to come from a place where our strengths are, where we feel validated, where we feel competent, and we go towards that.